morning. You know, the story is told of a man who wanted to cling so tightly to his money that he instructed his wife that when he died, he wanted her to take all of his money, put it in a sack, and take it up to the attic so that when his spirit left his body, he could grab it on the way by. So he passed away. His wife followed those instructions. And after he passed, she went upstairs to the attic and noticed that the bag of money was still there. She said, I knew I should have put that in the basement. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm the king of bad jokes. We've been talking about idolatry in this series, talking about the different gods that we serve, the American idols, if you will, in our lives. And I believe that this series is probably going to touch most, if not all of us, in some way, shape, or form. There may be some idols that we talk about that don't affect you any at all. But my guess is that money is one that, that virtually all of us have dealt with, a propensity maybe to worship and have to pull back the reins a little bit, because money is an easy God for people. Money is a security blanket. It's a ticket to happiness, or so people think. It comes in the form of, of, of paper, of, of metal, of plastic, of a file that says portfolio. Many people have invested everything into their wealth and it's killing them spiritually. I know I've used this illustration before, but it's so apt to what we're talking about. In the book, The Day America Told the Truth, a cross-section of Americans were asked the question, what would you do for $10 million? 25% said that they would abandon their family. 25% said that they would abandon their church. 16% said that they would leave their spouse. 10% said that they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% said that they would kill a stranger. And 3% said that they would give their children up for adoption for $10 million. Now this is chilling. But at the same time, it probably shouldn't surprise us too much. When you look around our culture, maybe when you look at your own life, and you see how much money has consumed you or those around you. The God of money has been around a long time. He used to be known as gold or silver or heads of cattle or animal skins, anything that could be used to trade or could be traded. But today, he's referred to as dough, as cash, as moolah, as Benjamins, whatever you want to call him, he's still the same. And in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, we read this. Woe to those who join house to house, they add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. God is pronouncing a woe on the Israelite people because of their mentality or their propensity toward money their consumption of greed. In this civilization, wealth was largely tied to what you owned. It was largely tied to agriculture as well. And the rich would use their means to take the land of others as their own possession. Notice again Isaiah's words, Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. It's lust coupled with power that is driven by selfishness. It's an early form of bowing to the God of money or greed. These are the actions of people who are controlled by covetousness. And it will stop at nothing to get what it wants. It's the mindset of one who has chosen to bow to the God of greed or money. This same disposition is illustrated for us in 1 Kings chapter 21. It's there that we find a man by the name of Naboth. And he had a vineyard. It was a vineyard that the king would like to have, King Ahab to be precise. King Ahab offers to trade with the man a vineyard that was of similar value so that he could have Naboth's vineyard, he even offered him money for it, but Naboth refused the offer. You see, Naboth's vineyard was part of the promise, the inheritance that God gave his people as part of the promised land and their share in it. And so to give that up, would be disobedient to God, and he didn't want to do that. 
And so like a spoiled child, Ahab sulks, he pouts, he gets angry, he refuses to eat until his wife, Jezebel, comes to the scene and says, just take it. You're the king. Why not? It belongs to you anyway. And she has Naboth murdered, and she says, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. In this tragic, somewhat extreme situation of Ahab and Jezebel brings to light the destruction that occurs when covetousness and greed takes hold of one's heart. Ahab and Jezebel failed to consider anybody but themselves in the situation. They wanted something, and they were going to have it. Didn't matter who had to pay. We hear folks pay lip service to the idea that money isn't everything. They say it won't bring you happiness. And yet we see that their lives portray something completely different. We hear people say that money can't buy you happiness, and they have millions and billions of dollars, and we assume that they all flew first class to some remote island somewhere and got together and decided to say that to make us feel better, right? But the truth of the matter is money cannot buy you the thing that matters the most. And bowing to the God of money will cost you the very thing that should matter most in your life. God saw fit to have his son speak about money and man's relationship to it And I believe Jesus approached this topic so often because he knew that money could be an easy God for people. Almost half of all the parables that Jesus told dealt with this subject of money. And there's good reason for this. The reason is because money tends to be God's chiefest competition. Money is consistently portrayed as God's chief competition. Of course, money really isn't the issue. It's man's relationship to money. Money is not the root of all evil. You hear that quite often, but the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is amoral. It's really nothing by itself. It's just paper. It's just coin. But our unhealthy attachment to it is what's important. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Beginning in verse 16, we read these words. And he, Jesus, told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That's interesting that nine times this man refers to himself. He talks about my crops, my barns, my my grain. It doesn't seem to occur to him that these things are not really his, right? These are blessings that have been bestowed upon him, but he can't see that. Who gave him the good crops? Who gave him the ability to work those crops? Who gave him the wealth that he has? Psalm 24 and 1 states, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein. Psalm 50, 10 through 12 reads, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Everything belongs to God. You don't own anything. It's not yours. It's God's. And the only reason you have it placed in your hands is because God gave it to you. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we're going to demolish the God of money. And we'll tear it down and not give it allegiance because we understand that we are nothing more than a steward, not an owner. A dad was talking to his son and he wanted to give him a gift. He loved his son. And he said, son, if I could if I could give you anything right now, what would you take? And he said, I want some french fries. And the dad said, what my son wants, he's going to get. We'll go to McDonald's and we'll get some french fries. And so they, they go into McDonald's and he, he doesn't give them just a regular order. He orders the supersized portion of french fries and they sit down and the dad watches his son consume them. And he's so proud to see his son so happy. And so the dad reaches over to grab a couple for himself, and the boy immediately puts his arms around them and hoards them to himself. And he says, no, mine. And the dad is a little taken aback by this. He thinks to himself, doesn't he know that I bought those fries for him? 
doesn't he know that I could go up there and I could buy 10 or 12 orders of fries just for myself and not give him any? Doesn't he know I'm 6 foot, 195 pounds, I could take all the fries I wanted, and he couldn't do anything about it? The dad is upset, and he's frustrated because the son doesn't realize who the giver of the fries is. And so as the dad thinks about it, he thinks, you know, the issue really isn't that he wouldn't give me a couple of fries. The issue is that he wouldn't let me into his little world that I created for him. And I believe God reacts the same way with us so many times. These aren't your fries. They don't belong to you. They belong to God, the one who gave them to you. And someday you're going to give an accounting for all the things that have been placed in your possession. Have you allowed your possessions to possess you? Have you allowed money to grab a stranglehold on your heart to where you have forgotten the originator of those blessings? My friends, God owns everything. Nothing in your hands is truly yours. You don't own anything. That's the trap that so many people fall into when it comes to money and the things that money can buy. You are not an owner. You are a steward. These aren't your fries. It's not your money. It's not your possessions. Everything belongs to God. It's as the wise Solomon said, as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that can carry in his hand. You can't take this stuff with you. All this stuff you've accumulated, all this money that you have in your possession, you can't take it with you. It stays here. Eventually will be burned up or spent by somebody else. Why then do we spend so much time and expend so much energy investing in something that we can't take with us anyway? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 26? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man exchange? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's a sad commentary how many people are exchanging their soul for earthly things, for things that they can't take with them anyway, and that will eventually cost them their spiritual livelihood. We destroy the God of money when we shift our mentality. When we realize that we are not an owner, but rather a steward. This is not always easy. Because I think we, we only naturally harbor the attitude of, this is mine. I worked hard for it. All of my blood, sweat, and tears were involved in me getting this. Therefore, it's mine. It's not yours. It's easy to get that way because of all these things that we have done in order to earn the things that we have. But who gave you the ability to even earn those things? God did. That in itself is a blessing. But owners have a different mentality than a steward. An owner says, I can use my resources however I want to. But a steward says, these aren't mine to begin with, so I've got to use them in a way that promotes God, advances his kingdom, makes him proud. Owners say, I'm not accountable for anyone, to anyone for how I spend my resources or how I use my resources. But a steward understands he is accountable to God, and therefore he better use his resources wisely. Owners are very reluctant to share any of their resources, but stewards are cheerful givers. Owners tend to, to honor the God of materialism, whereas stewards honor the one true God. Recognize that you are not an owner, that you are a steward. And that word steward in the Greek is the word oikonomos. And it basically means house arranger. It's about one who takes care of the things that have been entrusted to them. And that's what we are. We are house arrangers. We are God's stewards. You are a steward of everything that God has placed in your hands. Everything. Your time, not just your money, but your money, your spouse, your children, all of those things, all those blessings that have been plopped into your lap by God, they belong to him. You must take care of them in the time that you are here because eventually you'll give an accounting for how you took care of them. Nothing, I mean nothing, is truly yours, and we need to remember who owns everything. It all belongs to God. And it's only been granted to you as a blessing, and someday you will give an accounting for how you managed it. If you wasted your time, you'll have to answer for that. If you were abusive to your spouse or your children, you're going to have to answer for that. All of these things 
are blessings that we need to take pains, careful pains, to watch over, to take care of in a godly manner. You know, the, the steward has a very different perspective on life. Owners say, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But a steward says, how can I bless God with the blessings that he has bestowed upon me? You ever reflected back on your life? Back when you had little money? Most of us probably have been in a position where we first got married and we really had almost nothing. I was making $11,000 a year as an as assistant manager at a grocery store, still in school. My wife was still in school. She was a cashier at that grocery store where I was an assistant manager. We didn't have a lot. Fortunately, my grandfather, when he passed away, left us his house. It wasn't a, a mansion, but it was good enough for us. I think back to those times, and I think of how, how often we struggled just to make ends meet, how we wondered where the money was going to come from. I got a job coaching, made $26,000 a year, and thought, man, I'm rich. All the things I can do now. I got paid once a month. My wife was still in school, and I thought, how are we going to make it? But we did. And I look back on those times, and I think, was I any less happy than I am now? No. In fact, it probably do me well to revert back to those days in some ways because I was more frugal. I took care of things better because you know as well as I do, money's a funny thing. The more you get, the more you spend, right? And it's just a commonality among the American people that whatever we make, we spend, and a lot of people, in fact, live above their means. Sometimes we wonder, well, how can they afford that on their income? It's because they've, they've financed or mortgaged their life with a credit card. It's because they're up to their eyeballs in debt. A funny thing happens when we start to earn more money, and that is we start to spend more. We've got to somehow pull back the reins and realize that when we draw closer to God and allow Him to be our security, that suddenly we don't need the things that we think we need. Let me ask you, do you find your net worth in your net worth? Are you defined by success and how much you can earn? Are you constantly comparing what you have and how much you make to others? What's your anxiety level when it comes to your finances? To what extent are your dreams driven by money? What is your attitude toward giving? How you answer these questions may determine if your heart is given to the God of money. You know, it certainly, certainly do us all well to examine ourselves, examine our checkbook, examine our hearts, and see where it is that we are spending the majority of our money. What is it going to? And is it a reflection of the God that we serve? Here's another question to ponder. Are you allowing money to fill the space that God should inhabit? You know, the reason why money becomes God's chief competitor is that we tend to ascribe divine attributes to it. We turn to money to do the very thing for us that God wants to do for us. For instance, it becomes security, as we said earlier. Many of us feel that if we could just have a little more money that we would be set, like that rich man in Luke chapter 12. If we could just build some bigger barns and store up what we need in there, then we could eat, drink, and be merry. We could live a, a comfortable life, never having to worry again. Notice what is written in Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I may not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I do not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. You see, folks, we don't want our portion. We don't want our daily bread. We want our weekly bread. We want our monthly bread. We want our yearly bread. We don't want just enough to last for today. We want enough to last us a lifetime, two or three lifetimes, because that's where we find our security. When we should be finding our security in God, He should be the one that we rest comfortably in. Media mogul Ted Turner, speaking to 300 fellow philanthropist once said, keep a few hundred million at least because you never know, things could get really rough. My friends, our security should be found in God. Like Paul, we should learn to be content in whatever circumstances we are in. Like Psalm 23, if the Lord is your provider, 
If the Lord is your shepherd, that should be all you want or need. Money is also a source of satisfaction for so many of us. The man in Luke chapter 12 pondered his wealth and said, if I just accumulate a little more, then I can take life easy. He was rich before his good crop, but a little more was all that he needed, he thought, to be happy. And that's the deceitful nature of money. It promises a little more and a little more. If I get just a little more, I'll be happy. You know how much money it takes to be happy? Just a little more. That's all. You know, the very things that we pursue with our money guarantee that we won't be happy. We want a faster computer. They come out with faster computers every day, basically. We want a newer, or better car. When you, when you drive that new car off the lot, it be, depreciates greatly in value. They've already got a better one coming out in the next few months or few weeks. We want better clothes. They're constantly going in and out of style all the time. The things that we pursue guarantee that we'll never be satisfied. They're empty. Satisfaction must come from God in a relationship with Him. Ecclesiastes 5 and 10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. So quit trying to find satisfaction in the hollowness and emptiness of money and stuff. Instead, let's find satisfaction in God. Like Paul, let us learn to be content in whatever circumstance. Isn't it sad how many folks determine their wealth or their worth by their wealth? How many folks store up money because they think that's going to make them happy? Again, going back to Luke chapter 12, the gentleman in that story was completely and totally focused on himself and his wealth, how much he accumulated. He found his identity in his stuff. And many people do the same thing today. Money brings significance to them. The God of money is where we find our value and our worth. The man in Luke 12 had put his trust in, in his money and possessions. His plan to retire early was so that he could eat, drink, and be merry. But we know that's not what happened. Luke 12 and 20 tells us, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? Verse 21 states, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So what did this man really gain in the end? He lost it all. But even more tragic is not that he lost his earthly wealth, but he lost his soul in the process. What good does it do to be the richest man in the cemetery? If you gain millions upon millions or billions of dollars, if you're number one on the Forbes list of the, the wealthiest people in the world, but you lose your soul, what have you really gained? You're an absolute failure. We need to get back to what matters most, bowing to the right God, understanding that the God of money is never going to satisfy us. It's never going to bring significance. It's never going to bring us true security. The only one that does that is God. Your significance, your worth, your value is not measured by your bank account or how much money you have in your wallet or how much stuff you have sitting in your home or in your garage. Your value is determined by the cross. God forever determined your worth and your value when he sent his son to die on the cross. And so, the cross, not a dollar sign, is the symbol of your worth. You ever thought about if money could talk? What if money could talk? What would it say? There's a parable about a $50 bill that was talking to a $1 bill. And the $1 bill asked the $50 bill, so where have you been? The $50 bill said, you know, I've been at casinos, I was on a cruise ship for a while, I've been to the Super Bowl and to the mall and all those different places, and here I am. The $50 bill said, where have you been? The $1 bill said, oh, you know, the typical place, church. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to give all of your money to the church. I'm not suggesting that it's a sin to be rich. What I am saying is that it is a sin to bow to the God of money. It is a sin to allow greed and covetousness to infiltrate your heart. It is a sin to allow something else to push God off the throne and to sit on the throne of your heart. You know, it's ironic how the phrase, in God we trust, appears on our money. Ironic because so often we put our trust and our faith in our money rather than God. 
We have more faith in the almighty dollar than we do the almighty God. Understand where we put our money reveals where we have placed our trust. If you can keep a loose grip on your money, then you understand what it means to be a steward and not an owner. If you can be a cheerful giver, you understand what it means to be a steward and not an owner. And if you can bless others with your money, if you can bless God with your money, if you understand the originator of those blessings has placed it in your hands and therefore it's not yours to begin with, then you understand what it means to serve the right God. Destroy the God of money this morning. Become a faithful child of God. Let him sit on the throne of your heart. Maybe you've done it. Maybe you are a Christian that struggles with this and struggles with serving this idol, then we want to help you with that this morning. If perhaps you have not put on Christ in baptism, and become a child of God. Do that this morning. Serve the right God in the right manner. Come now as we stand, as we sing. This is my Father's work.